uh, to our crew in uh, Sabut for a while. And uh, I guess uh, the advantage of, uh, of uh, being late at getting you here is that you're starting on a new journey and maybe you can tell us a little bit about that too. Um, sure. I, I think you've gone from, uh, you know, working with uh, large corporates like IBM and then, uh, you know, doing Yodley and, and now a, a new startup in uh, Tilled Hat. Uh, so I, I don't yeah. know how much you can tell us about that. It'd be nice to hear about it also. And uh, of course, uh, uh, you know, uh, just about uh, the journey and the topic that you're talking about, I think is going to be very interesting uh, for the students here and, and the uh, community at large. Uh, you know about uh, how do you actually have, get a mm -hmm. on my side? Sorry. Hi, Om. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, can the others hear me? Is the connectivity issue on my end or on Om's? Can anybody just confirm? Yes, I can hear you. you yes, can. sir. I can hear you. Oh. Okay. We so. Can. Oh man, this is sad. Uh, Hi, Om. Hello. Oh dear, I think we've lost him. Hi, Om. You're muted. He's so sorry. Hey, sorry, sir. No, no problem. Yes, yes, we can hear you now. Uh, okay, this is this is a bit embarrassing. I'm sorry about this. Not at all. Not sure what happened. This is uh, this is the world we are living in now, right? With the increasing uncertainty, and uh, you know, uh, the probabilists uh, probabilists are having a laugh here, and the Bayesians are are saying, right, you know, we we've got more complexity to deal with now. So, um, oh, we've, I think we've lost him again. Mm -mm. No, are you there, Om? Um, uh, Om, I can I. He I think your connection is a little flaky. I, I know I just changed it from, I just changed like two of my connections and I don't know what's happening. Uh, you know, this is like Murphy's law. <laughs> the connection works every day and you know, I, mean, I, I have two backup connections. So I've tried the first one. Okay. Know, hopefully I don't have to go to the second one, but, but let's see. Brilliant, brilliant. Okay, so well, with, uh, without, uh, you know, wasting uh, the time, you know, uh, introducing you, uh, you know, Om, uh, thank you again for uh, taking the time out to speak to uh, us all. And I'll hand over to you um, if you want to just share screen and uh, right. wonderful. Right. Can you all see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. I have to get this out. Okay. Uh, and and Sarabjot, is this, I mean, should I just make this into a one-way conversation or would you would you like people to just stop and ask me questions? Either way is fine with me. You know, uh, we've had uh, both ways run in the past. Uh, whatever you're more comfortable with, if you want to stop at a certain point and ask their questions, uh, you know, everybody here is used to typing their questions into the uh, chat window. So uh, the alternative is that when you when there are a couple of questions, maybe uh, I can even prompt you and say, um, you know, uh, could you take some questions? Would that work for you? Oh. Hello. Yeah. Okay. Great. Excellent. So let's let's just uh, take it and uh, you know if there are a number of questions in the in the beginning, I mean in the middle, I'll I'll, I'll just uh, try and interject and ask you the questions. Right? Sure. Sure. And sure. No, that sounds good. And just a small thing, Sarabjod, in case my connection goes off or you guys are not able to hear me, I won't look at the phone unless it's a call from you. So, uh, right. <laughs> sure, sure. And, okay. and like, uh, you know, I should also say that we are like sponges. We love having people come and talk. So we are not in a big rush to cut you off and finish this at the hour. So if it takes a little longer, if you're comfortable carrying on a little bit. It's, sure. It's not sure, no, that sounds good. Right. Okay, great. Thank you. I had sure. over okay. okay, great, great. Uh, so, so thank you, Sarab Jodh, and thank you for, you know, for, to the entire team, which is, you know, which has organized this talk. I'm very happy to be here and, and also feel honored to be here. I'm guessing there are, you know, this is also being live streamed, so people may watch this later on. So if there are any questions, please reach out to Sarab, Sarab Jodh or me, and, you know, uh, one of us will be very happy to, uh, to take the conversation ahead. Uh, 
so when sarabjot and i started talking a few months ago uh, we thought it would be good to you know to talk about not just one application of uh, of machine learning or data science or whatever you call it, call it but also in terms of what is the quote unquote mindset that is needed to uh, to think in a data driven way and so that's sort of what the major theme of my talk is um and towards the end of it if time permits i'll i'll walk you through one use case where uh, having a data driven mindset mindset really helps um so before i move on uh, right sorry what i thought is i'll very briefly tell you who i am what my background is more than anything else this is just to tell you the kind of biases that i will bring into this conversation over the next one hour or so you know if i came from a particular background obviously those you know those backgrounds will influence quote and quote biases that i bring and i think uh, everybody who's listening to it now or later on should be aware of it uh, so i have a phd in machine learning this was back in 2006 you know even before data science became uh, in thing uh, and so this was in uh, university of maryland college park and this was in speech recognition at that point hmm sirin markov models were the thing today of course you have lstms and and so on and so we worked on that as part of my phd then i was with ibm research xerox research doing a bunch of uh, speech text image video analytics kind of work uh, then for the last three and a half four years um, i was with yardley infotech running their uh, data science division from a delivery perspective so this was a big shift so while one bias for me is to do a lot of systematic very deep machine learning kind of work you know build papers and patents and so on the the big shift that happened about 4 years ago was when i headed the uh, data science delivery for yardley which uh, some of you may know is a fintech organization um, and so idea there was to on a daily basis deliver data product so what it really taught me was how do you marry the the systematic machine learning approaches with the practical aspects that are needed to deliver a uh, a data product for which a customer is paying and for which there is uh you know there are strict slas or service level agreements and so on so this experience you know combination of of systematic machine learning research with delivering data driven products on a daily basis really gave me the confidence to start a deep tech startup about 6 7 months now 8 months ago uh, we calling it tilda hat uh, folks from machine learning background can appreciate tilda stands for modeling the the randomness you know how we say x tilde n which means x is a random variable modeled as a uh, as a gaussian distribution you know n and so on and hat is the estimate so x hat of x and so on so our goal is that we are going to model the world as a random process tilde and we are going to come up with models or learning techniques that will estimate it and hence the hat i know it sounds a bit you know a bit nerdy and all that but but the minute we came up with this word uh, we were really very happy about it um my partner in this is samiran roy he is a masters in machine learning or other reinforcement learning from iit bombay okay um okay i said you know i'm just going to if you don't mind interrupt you you know uh, every so often to see if you are if you guys are still able to hear me if there is any issue uh, because i see a pop up that says my internet connection may be unstable Um, yeah, so, it's, it's good for now. It's good for now. Good for now. Okay, good, good, good. Okay, so um, right. So before we get into <clears throat> a lot of details about you know data science, machine learning, all sorts of things, uh, let's take a step back and see why is it that all of this makes sense today. And this slide, unless you are really staring at it very closely, you will not be able to make out what it says, and that's by design. What I wanted to show here. was uh, you know essential things like uh, transportation right cars or automobiles and so on it took about 60 odd years for these essential things to reach about 50 million users 60 odd years okay 60 years for automobiles to reach 50 million users which are essential because if i don't have a car or a cycle you know or any way of transporting myself from one place to the other i won't get my basic necessities like milk or food and so on right contrast that with whatsapp or any such you know any such technologies which are not as essential as food let's say right and so you would imagine that they would take a lot longer to reach 50 million uh, 50 million users that's not the case pokemon on one hand took only 19 days whatsapp i think took 
less than a year it took like i think 9 months or so to reach 50 million users so the point is that you know whatever happens in a very local setup today has a huge huge potential of propagating to many many users they may or may not like it they may or may or may not find it useful but this whole propagation of information at scale at rapid speed is what is happening today in a hugely unprecedented way i mean of course we should add tiktok in this um uh, but but you you know how tiktok has become you know just viral and now of course got into some trouble but that's the main point i wanted to make here so that people who may be looking at this talk or maybe attending this talk with some hesitation that oh you know data science is still a big hype uh, i would like to tell them that no it's not there is a lot of hype that is created around it for rightful reasons because the virality is what the kind of virality that we are witnessing today is unprecedented and data is at the center of it and i'll talk a little bit about why data is at, at its center in the interest of time i'm just going to lay out the whole thing uh, but essentially in my mind there are three different components or three different pillars that are contributing to this whole data analytics or data driven way of thinking the first is exponential growth in digital data so just to give you some examples the us library of congress which is supposed to be the biggest physical library today uh, has about 15 terabytes of data back in 2012 2013 when twitter had no images no video so only text on a daily basis they were generating about 8 terabytes of data right so half of the library of congress us library of congress was created in a day uh, on a daily basis in twitter back then right so that's one one aspect of it you you have everybody has a smartphone everybody is able to create gen, uh, data very uh, very easily the second thing is or second thing within the data, uh, data part is now that you've created this data you want to be able to disseminate it and that's where you know th thanks to geo and airtel and everybody else it is becoming very very easy to consume the data to propagate it and so on right everybody has a smartphone more importantly everybody has a 4g connection and so a funny video a funny comment funny text image anything or even informative videos like this are getting transmitted very quickly so that's one reason for why the data analytics is becoming such a central thing in in today's day and age uh, okay second thing is we have access to a lot of modeling frameworks and this is where you know sarab jodh i'm sure will will be able to appreciate and hopefully others also is about 10 15 years ago when we were you know doing a lot of uh, data science or machine learning research the frameworks were not accessible there was no concept of gits at that point everybody had their own internal uh, you know version control so like we had cvs and so on so i remember when i was when i joined ibm research i had to spend about first two three months just understanding the tech stack that ibm had before i could do any kind of meaningful research work right in today's day and age that's not i mean that's laughable because anybody who let's say wants to do a uh, name identity recognition or uh machine translation or any such you know state of the art projects will not spend 3 months trying to understand a particular framework first thing they will do is go to one of these open source frameworks download a code spend half an hour reading through the readme file and then directly jump into the processing of the data right so that's the other reason why data analytics is becoming such a big thing there is access to frameworks which have uh, don't mistake me this these frameworks have taken a long time to build like 20 30 years easily to build these frameworks and bring it to the stage that they are today but the big difference is today these frameworks are easily available so what gets called as democratization of machine learning is truly happening because of these open source frameworks in fact we use tensorflow to quite a lot okay the third thing is you have the data now you have the frameworks but you obviously need a lot of compute power and this is where you know my example from xerox research comes in we had to spend quite a lot of money and time in the beginning when we were setting up our multimedia analytics research in in xerox uh, about i think 6 7 years ago we had to spend up front a lot of capex money to get our you know get our compute computing uh, ad, uh, computing operations in place you know get a get a cold room get a administrator and so on 
today you don't have to do that right all you have to do today is get a login on one of the cloud providers you know be it azure or aws or or, or google and that's it you are good to go there is no upfront cost to be uh, to be paid more importantly or just as importantly the the kind of huge computational uh, power that you have access to is unprecedented again right uh, and i was just contrasting this with what happened to the mission that went to the moon and so on so anyways all three of these things coming together is really what is leading to uh, to data taking a center stage okay uh, i'm just going to pause here and see if there are any questions if not i can just move on not at this point too okay good so so then once we have once we have hopefully understood or appreciated why data analytics is becoming a center stage let us see what are the kind of new problems that are uh, that are solvable because of because of all these three things coming together and again i'm going to lay it out typically and unfortunately what happens is most people who are excited about data science data analytics machine learning start with just the last bullet here which is what are the ways in which i can derive actionable insights and in my mind that is of course very very important but only a small component of the work the other four actually in my mind take up about 80 90% of the cool work the first one is data capture right if you do not have the right amount of data captured at the right granularity you will not be able to do any of the following things so one example i like to give in, in these talks is let's say somebody is listening to my talk and is continuously writing down every word of what i'm saying then the data capture is is 100% there the person has 100% granularity of data and everything is captured but the experience of the talk you know where i'm doing some hand gestures stressing on some words pointing to something may be lost and so it's very important that you know we think about different ways in which data is captured so that the user experience is not lost at the same time only relevant data is captured and again you know you look at any of the big companies uh, you know right from very simple ones like tinder i'm sure everybody knows here about tinder they have made you know user experience extremely extremely, extremely simple and that's part of the reason why they have become so uh, you know so popular Uh, same thing with any of the food delivery organizations a lot of their effort goes into reducing the the way in which they uh, the friction in which the data capture happens right so very very important problem uh, i would encourage everybody here to think about how this problem can be solved continues to be a, a big problem second one is data storage and i have put cost in in quotations here because let us say you know, some organization stores data which is not really valuable for that organization's purposes and if any of that data gets leaked then there's a big cost from a pr perspective uh, that has to be paid so data storage becomes a very important aspect and uh, you know not not just from the uh, from the actual monetary cost of saving it but also the cost of what happens if you know with the responsibility that you have once you're storing the data and and now of course with gdpr and indian uh, indian governments its own uh, Uh, data protection rules coming in uh, this will become a lot more stringent third is data retrieval this is a topic which you know which is very close to my heart and hopefully as as we progress i'll tell you a little bit about this the the way i would contrast uh, you know two extreme ways in which data retrieval can and should happen is is one is ircpc right everybody i'm sure knows about ircpc the website that we use for booking uh, booking tickets uh, railway tickets rather now what happens is when there is a tatkal window that opens up real time retrieval of data is extremely extremely important right because there you want to know whether the train that i am looking for is available is it is the berth that i am looking for available and so on and it has to happen real time because if that is not available you want to move to a different uh, you know different alternative and the the reason this is all powered so well is the kind of database the kind of queries that are used at the back end are very different from let us say a financial transaction data where the real time is not as as much of a value as the sanctity of the data and the security of the data so a lot of the times when you know when when big transactions like millions of dollars of investments are happening uh, 
uh, you know Goldman Sachs or or JP Morgan or any such other big you know big investment houses they are not as critical about making it real time as they are about ensuring that the data is high fidelity highly secure and so on so in that case the data retrieval mechanisms the data storage and the database architecture that you would have will be very very different this gets into a much much bigger problem when we talk about big scales right and and so that's why this problem is very close to my heart all of the previous three organizations we have had to deal with humongous amounts of data and different contextual retrieval uh, problems in fact in tilda hat also we are doing very something very similar uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that the fourth problem is not so much engineering or um, you know our coding related it's more from a business side but 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 very important uh, which is how do you connect the dots somebody gives me a data somebody gives me a problem somebody tells me the uh, the restrictions that are there on data access and so on now i as a business analyst or as a product manager or program manager i have to figure out what is the value that this data will bring to whom and where in the value pipeline can i insert this particular processing a lot of the times this gets overlooked unfortunately and i have seen a lot of big failures happen because this particular aspect wasn't uh, you know wasn't sorted in the beginning uh, so a lot of data driven thinking from a product perspective or from a program perspective uh, becomes very important and of course the last one i talked about which is now actually applying one or more machine learning models algorithms to derive that insight which is actionable which is truly the end value to the company or to the end user okay now very quickly i'll talk, talk a little bit about what does it mean to be to be doing artificial intelligence what is artificial what is intelligence and so on and the reason i want to very quickly talk about this is this leads into some ways in which you should be thinking before you even touch a problem and say it's going to be a data driven problem so om very quickly before you go on to uh, this uh, next phase uh, sure. there's a question here and i guess it uh, pertains to your last slide uh, where sure. it says what about the step of converting the business problem to a data problem before uh, we start to look into the data is it not the very first thing so is this really a sequence that you're following from data capture or is there actually kind of uh, you know a, a circular kind of aspect to this where you really start from the business problem oh very true this is a very good question it is a circular problem uh, and i would the first so the first part of the circle or well not the first part the play, the a logical place to insert yourself in that circle would be at the data processing stage which is connecting the dots um in fact you know i have a separate talk that i typically give to to you know largely management or mba kind of people is is where i downplay a lot of these data processing part but i uh, but i talk a lot about the program aspect and the and the product aspect so you're absolutely right the first part is really to figure out whether this problem is solvable by data and and you will be surprised how many times the answer is no even in today's day and age and and you know you should we should all be perfectly happy to accept that a lot of the problems need not be solved in a data driven way it could just be you know simple rules that will uh, that will help out um so so yes coming back to your question sir or, or the person who was asking the question yes the very first step would be to uh, to understand and appreciate whether data is needed to solve the problem and if so what kind of data once that is that is understood only then should we try to go through the, these steps and i think later on i have a slide that talks a little more about it okay great i okay. think i have it let's let, let's see yeah. sure thanks thanks so great great okay so uh, right so what is artificial intelligence very very simply speaking <clears throat> if a if a machine does something that if a human had done we would have called that human he or she as an intelligent person then that particular machine will be get will be called as uh, artificially intelligent or some such right that's that's the basic idea now intelligence is the ability to acquire and apply knowledge and this is where you know something very interesting happens if i memorize something i may get called as an intelligent kid because a lot of the times exams are you know you are evaluated in your curricular uh, evaluations based on what you have memorized but that is not true intelligence 
right the true intelligence is memorization yes is a is an important aspect of it but which is the acquiring part or the you know acquire knowledge part the second part is the applying of that knowledge to a unseen or unknown problem and that's where the intelligence comes in right so let me just walk you very quickly through a couple of examples if somebody was able to distinguish between a cat and a dog would you call that person intelligent the answer is it depends it's a intelligent kid but if if i or somebody in this uh, in this talk was to make this distinction between a cat and a dog we'll say you know okay that's that's just that's table stakes everybody should know this on the other hand if somebody was able to distinguish between a man and a woman okay slightly more intelligent kid but still you are 3 4 years of age happy versus sad this is probably a different kind of intelligence which is what gets called as emotional intelligence and so on um now boiling point of water i i'll pause here you know because we are not in a you know interactive session here but i'll pause here let everybody think about what the answer is and then see whether knowing the answer is being intelligent or not most of us would say 100 degree celsius a truly <laughs> intelligent quote and quote person would say it depends it depends on the impurity that is there in the water and a bunch of other factors even then this is not being intelligent this is just being somebody who has memorized whatever was taught in basic science classes right so so there's some amount of intelligence yes but there's a lot of domain expertise similarly answering this question will somebody click on this ad that i'm showing uh, and if the person clicks what is the kind of uh, uh, user profile for that person who has clicked on it person who can answer this question is oops okay i messed up uh, the animation here anyways so the person who would click on it you're answering those questions is is intelligent yes some amount of intelligence is needed but there's a lot more of domain expertise that is needed so hopefully what this slide should convince you is that defining intelligence and hence artificial intelligence is is quite a complex problem it's best not to do it uh, you know it's best just to look at the problem that you're solving where the value is and so on but but i wanted to just show this so that everybody hopefully goes aha yes now we understand what you know why artificial intelligence defining it is a bit of a complex problem now these are in my mind some of the truly intelligent jobs and i'll tell you also why they are why they are intelligent first one is you have to collect trash and throw it in a dustbin navigate second one is navigate a car through a busy intersection and the third one is to defeat a chess uh, chess grandmaster or you know let's say if you guys are following the the game of go uh, then you know defeating a go uh, go master um the reason these are intelligent is you cannot memorize all the possible combinations of where the trash will be where the you know what the room setup is going to be and where the trash can is going to be and so on similarly you cannot memorize what are the different positions of other cars at a particular intersection what is the optimal route for you to take and so on let us say you know you had you had humongously powerful brain and you memorized all of that even then what will happen is the one move that you make will change the rest of the ecosystem right the minute you uh, the minute you move your car from one place to the other at this busy intersection somebody else is going to come and occupy the spot that you left or something else is going to move in front and so on and so you have to dynamically think about what your next step has to be right and that's why these tasks are intelligent a new uh, you know new framework of machine learning called reinforcement learning you know is coming in which which has been around for many years but now it's becoming a lot more popular uh, because that helps with solving a lot of these problems so in my mind these are truly the intelligent uh, you know intelligent problems that that need to be solved and some other problems from a uh, from a day to day perspective is how can i how can i plan to repay all my loans and still own a house that you know that's my dream house and so on so these this is the definition of uh, intelligent jobs in my mind not so much distinguishing a versus b and, and so on right now now that hopefully you you uh, agree and appreciate what it means to uh, to have artificial intelligence uh, what are truly some examples of truly intelligent jobs and so on let us now see whether it is possible to teach intelligence to machines and this is the the switch in 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 the talk from sort of introductory piece 
to now truly getting into what do we have to think about as we in the practical world try to solve a problem using uh, you know using artificial intelligence or data science or, or machine learning whatever you want to call them yeah okay so what are the challenges i'm just going to lay them all out here so that this again ties back to the question that uh, that sarav jodh you had relayed which was where do you start one challenge in teaching intelligence to machines is success criteria is not always very well defined and one example is a movie review right or a product review um it's not always clear whether a particular movie has n number of parameters which are defined which will make it successful right i mean one thing that may come to mind is the success in box office should make the money should make the movie successful but then what about art movies which may not be very successful in the box office but a lot of people may enjoy them enjoy those movies and so on right so success criteria is not always very well defined and again to the to the question that was asked earlier a lot of my time a lot of the time that i would spend spend with the product teams and and the marketing team customer facing teams was to find out what is it mean to say that my data product is successful right and then that it's at a very uh, very business level right and then as a data scientist our role is to take that business definition of success and convert it into some kind of a data driven success one example and i may have a slide later on but because it has come up here i'll, I'll, I'll talk about it is let's say sarabjot went and saw a movie last weekend and i go and ask him sarabjot how was the movie it's very natural for him to say the movie was fantastic direction was wonderful i love the songs right it'll be highly artificial for him to say you know what om i would rate the movie 3.8 out of 5 right if he starts talking like that you know not not many people will ask him how the movie was next time onwards right because that just sounds very artificial but that's a big big paradigm shift between how machines think versus how we humans think right humans thinks think as lovely movie wonderful direction and so on very qualitative ways whereas machines want to know 3.8 out of 5 4.2 out of 5 and so on because only then can they form some models okay so that's one uh, second is data is not always available and the beauty is we humans don't need a lot of data to learn like think about this there are about what 6.5 odd billion uh, human beings um we've not seen even a tiny fraction of them right yet we are able to distinguish a human face from any other living being or any other object right so we must have probably looked at what 10000 faces roughly you know in, over the past whatever you know eight, uh, days you've been interacting with humans it's a very tiny proportion of data and yet we are almost 100% accurate about that kind of a distinction so today when people talk about you know collecting a lot of data and trying to pump in millions of data samples to to make your systems intelligent i defer because i think making systems dependent too much on data is like getting them to memorize a lot of lot of lot of uh, patterns rather than really helping them learn and apply whatever knowledge they have learned yeah the third thing that makes for a problem is is this example i gave you of uh, of driving through a busy intersection that the decision that you make will definitely contribute to the dynamics of the problem that you're trying to solve and hence your machines that you're training have to be you know have to predict what will happen and accordingly change uh, you know change their um, you know change their behavior best example of this is what used to happen in the early days you know the first ever example of this uh, brief history lesson is kalman filters you know the filters that you know the technique that was used to figure out what kind of a projectile motion a particular missile will take predict where it is going to be a few seconds from now and then accordingly fire you know fire the the counter missile and and so on right that is where you are predicting what will happen and then accordingly um, you know trying to aim for that predicted location the fourth most important thing is feedbacks are not always instantaneous and so you have to have a way in which even if the feedback comes two days later you want to be able to incorporate that back into your system so these are some very important practical challenges uh, that we all have to uh, have to be cognizant of and prepare 
uh, you know, if you're trying to teach intelligence to, to machines. This last piece, I want to stress a little bit because this is the piece where, which becomes very important if you are delivering data products, which is what I was doing for about three odd years. What happens is, you know, you build a system today, you gave it to your customers tomorrow, let's say, the customer uses it day after or over a week or whatever, finds a problem, the, the reverse flow of that problem will be a couple of hops. The customer writes an email or picks up a phone and calls you a customer executive who then tries to understand the problem, tries to put it in, you know, in, in some sort of a succinct manner. It then comes to your team. You then will have to process it and then say whether it is solvable or not. And then the customer has to be told about this very quickly. Right? So you need to have a, a very systematic way in which your machines can incorporate this feedback in a very systematic way. What I, so the reason I'm saying systematic so many times is a lot of the times the feedback that you get may be orthogonal to the, to the way the systems are performing today, right? And so you have to figure out a way to, to incorporate that. But a lot of the times the feedback may be totally opposite of what your systems were asked to do. And we humans are very good at this, very good at saying, oh, you know what? I changed my mind. Instead of red color uh, product, I want a blue color product. So when you know when you have feedback which is quote unquote contrary to what was earlier told, you need to have systemic ways in which that feedback can be incorporated without messing up with whatever has gone in so far. Again, a lot of research has gone in this area. Very important from a practical perspective. Okay, the next thing is uh, you know is the textbooks that you need for teaching intelligence. So the idea is I'll start with a very simple example. Let's say you know. We have to teach our kids how to distinguish between the red and green. These are the two examples I'm giving here, right? Red is on the top, green is at the bottom. Hopefully everybody agrees that red is what the color I have shown in the top, green is the color I have shown in the bottom. Very easy to distinguish, hence very easy to teach a machine. But almost never will you have a problem as simple as this in the real world. What will happen in the real world is this. Right. Essentially, what I've done is red, red, green. I have now made it into a bunch of other colors. Now, if I was to ask people in this, you know, in this virtual room to distinguish which one is navy blue versus which one is violet, I am sure a substantial percentage of people will have different answers. Similarly, orange versus dark yellow, green versus dark green and so on. The minute I give you a lot of options, your answers will become fuzzy. And this is where the systems will also get beaten up. So the idea is the labels that we are providing to the, to the systems, if those labels are not consistent, then what the system will learn will also not be consistent. Right. And there is a huge amount of research that goes into this area. It's called RNR reproducibility and repeatability. When we were doing some of our work, especially in, in Xerox and Yordley, uh, in, in fact, in Yordley, I had to spend a lot of effort because this was a production system to really have very strict RNRs, uh, not roles and responsibilities, but uh, reproducibility and repeatability. So let me explain that you know, in, in, a, in just a minute. Repeatability is when the same human looks at the same problem two days or you know, twice or n number of times and gives the same answer. So the idea is, if you look at this, you know, this color that I'm showing here in, the, in this arc or cone, today I look at it and I say it is dark blue. Tomorrow, same person, same image, same environment. So there is no, no, no external factors affecting my decision. Same time of the day, let's say. I'm shown this and I say this to be navy blue, then my repeatability has taken a hit. That's repeatability. Uh, a decent number for repeatability is anywhere upwards of 80%. Reproducibility is when two people sitting in the same environment shown the same question, how many times do they answer the same way? So in this case, Sarabjod and I sitting in the same room, shown the same image, we're not allowed to talk to each other. How many times do we agree with the color that each of us has labeled for this particular code? 
that is called reproducibility and as you can imagine the more number of people doing this in parallel the the tougher it will be to get a high high value for reproducibility and then that's why there are very systematic ways in which you do what is called as priming priming of the persons who are labeling your data and so on if the if the data is not labeled properly garbage in what you get is garbage out so very important that you have very uniform quote unquote textbooks for teaching intelligence again this is not so much a, unfortunately not so much seen as a problem of data scientists but as somebody else i very strongly believe this is a problem for the data scientists and everybody in the ecosystem to be worried about okay this problem is uh, this is this is actually a very interesting problem and it <laughs> although i knew about this kind of a problem it still took us a while to figure out that this was what was killing us in in one of our products in in one of the earlier uh, companies the idea is let us say you've got your data labeled you figured out the models that you want to use but you have to also figure out how do you want to penalize incorrect learning so in this example what i'm showing you is a dog a cat and a jaguar right the way i have drawn them or the way i have placed them rather is each one of them is equidistant from the other right and so what i'm saying here is if i confuse a dog with a cat the cost that i have to pay is exactly the same cost that i will pay if i was to confuse that dog with a jaguar similarly on the cat side if i was to confuse the cat with the dog i have to pay a cost of x same thing same cost i pay if i confuse that cat with a jaguar do you guys see a problem in this i hope some some of you are at least nodding your heads and saying yes there is a problem uh but there are actually two problems okay and that that's where the uh, the nuances of knowing what kind of a objective function now i'm talking a little bit data science uh, what kind of an objective function to use so let us say the problem i'm trying to solve is whether i should pet that animal or not right which means it's a problem of domestic animal versus wild animal in that case if i was to confuse the cat with the dog huh, not a big problem right not a big problem but if i was to confuse that cat with a jaguar huge problem so it's a problem of survival right and so accordingly my costs have to be different on the other hand if the problem was of distinguishing cat family animals from canine uh, family animals then confusing a cat with dog is a huge problem but confusing a cat with a jaguar or leopard or tiger is not because they are all coming from the cat family right so knowing this business problem which is again what we talked about a little earlier is very important formulating it in a data way is you know have to go through these stages this this part which is the defining the objective function in the in the most appropriate way uh, unfortunately gets gets pushed very often very very important problem guys if you want to take away one thing so far please know that looking at the objective function is very important and so in this case you know if the problem was to distinguish between domestic animals and and wild animals this would be the right way of penalizing that jaguar stays very far cat and dog it's okay if they stay close by yeah okay any uh, any questions uh no question from the audience but i i love what you've just brought out here right is is the the cost of uh, misclassification and there was a a time where uh, there was a lot of research being done and and there were papers specifically if you remember you know back in the early 2000s specifically looking at cost sensitive classification and we don't see that very much these days right and especially with these frameworks that you're talking about where typically uh, you know if you just picked up the framework and applied a, a function to learn a model uh, the cost functions that are being used are given an equal weight to misclassification so uh, you know what's happening here i mean there seems to be a kind of a you know it's it's obvious that cost sensitivity is important but yet uh, you know it doesn't seem to be talked about as much now um, can you shed some light on that right very interesting so the only the only well uh, what the only big effort that i have seen uh, so far in this in the recent times is the gan 
right? A generative adversarial networks. The big thing that they have done is change the cost function, right? So, so that's one big, big effort. A lot of the other efforts are not so much focused on, uh, at least not that, not that I'm aware of, which are focused on figuring out different ways of coming up with these cost functions. Uh, but yes, it's a very important problem to be looked at. I think people are a lot more focus is on using whatever you know, whatever models are present off the shelf, and then just you know uh, running with them. And that's where a lot of error analysis becomes very important. This is a bit of a digression, but hopefully you know this is of value to everybody. Uh, sort of, the, would you agree that doing a lot of error analysis will then tell you whether the problem is with my cost function? or the problem is with the way I have parameterized my data or just the lack of generalizability in my data. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think especially with class imbalance, it becomes so important, right? And half right. the time people are not even looking at that. So. Right. <laughs> and, and most problems in the world, thankfully have a class, class imbalance, right? Yeah. I mean, otherwise it'll be a problem. Like imagine if 50% of people who went for cancer testing had cancer, that's a problem. We only want 2% of them to have you know, to, to have a malignant tumor. And so class, class imbalance is very important for all the real world problems, but solving them, you're absolutely right, is, you know, is a problem in itself. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good, good, good. Then, uh, then let's be, let me move to a slightly different topic and then we'll move to the fourth topic uh, soon after. So, so far we talked about, you know, what does it mean to be building, uh, you know, ML solutions? What are the kind of uh, things that we have to remember you know, uh, I want to make a slight, uh, slight uh, digression and come to a topic which, again, I have seen not many people pay a lot of attention to, but in, in my mind, it's very important, uh, which is the following. Everybody talks about machine learning, right? But machine learning is an enabler. It is not the end goal, right? I mean, tomorrow, let us say somebody comes and sells you a solution and says, Sir, this solution is built on the state-of-the-art machine learning uh, models. There's a high chance you will not buy it. You will buy it just you will not buy it just because he said he or she said that. You will buy it only if it solves a particular problem that was a that was really a critical problem for you know in your day-to-day -day life. And that's where ML systems are are enablers. They are not the final solution. This brings to the next the point that I'm displaying on this slide, which is that you should be always worried about what is the user experience, what is what are the ways in which the user is going to interact with your system, and come up with ways in which that interaction camouflages your ML shortcomings and or highlights the cases where you know your ML systems are very strong. And so I'm giving one example here. If you were to go and you know, search for a simple thing like Prime Minister of India, Google in the back end obviously is running a bunch of machine learning algorithms. In a split second, it comes back with a bunch of answers. But what you see here is obviously you're not interacting with the machine learning algorithm. You're interacting with the, with the user, user interface of typing in the Google window and getting the answer. What you see here is that the one click has been reduced. You are shown the answer directly which creates for an aha moment, right? Now contrast that with this question, which is where do the MPs of India meet? The answer is again, the first click, right? Parliament of India, wonderful, correct answer. But because the backs, the engine at the, at the back, the ML engine or the data driven engine wasn't as confident as it was on the left side, it did not show a zero click answer, right? Or what is called as a knowledge panel. It did not show, yeah, it's mentioned here. It did not, it did not show, it, show it as a knowledge panel because the risk of getting a wrong answer is from a UI UX perspective is, especially UX perspective is horrible, right? If you got the wrong answer, the user experience is really bad. Whereas here, the user experience is only, only deteriorated slightly. The user has to just click on one extra, you know, one link, uh, so one extra click. But what has happened here is, very beautifully, the, the confidence of the underlying ML system is integrated with the experience that is given to the user, right? And this is very, very important. I see a lot of people not looking at this when they are building end products, especially the products which are driven by, you know, data-driven techniques as their backbone. 
another example and this is you know i'm sure everybody has seen this open any of your favorite you know word editing uh, software and you type this word t e h i i just typed this here in uh, in powerpoint and uh, it will automatically collect automatically correct it to t h e the right beautiful user experience because what it has learned is 99.9% of the times people when they write t e h they actually mean t h e so today or whenever i had added, made this slide when i wrote t e h it automatically corrected to t t h e and then i had to go back and change it a few times before it asked me should i not should i stop auto auto spell correction and i had to say yes right but most of the times i make that mistake and it's a aha for me that when it corrects you know t e h to t h e automatically right this is the second example where i typed visit palace but i forgot to put the space and so when i right click on it because i see the the red underline and so on it suggests what is the likely correct way of writing this again creates for a very good experience right third is i just typed some garbage it again showed me a spelling error by that red uh, you know that red underline but it did not give me any suggestions and that's because the underlying ml algorithm did not return any spelling with a high confidence right imagine if it did not have if it had the same uh, you know same user experience for all three of these it would create for a horrible experience if it changed this whatever spelling into automatically into whatever it thought was the right answer it will create for a horrible experience right and so that's where the the ml systems outputs have to be interpreted in the context of how the user is going to interact with the system very very important okay um if there are if there are no questions i will talk about one use case where bringing all of these holistic things together makes a lot of you know ma makes it essential that we bring all of these things together any questions for me please carry on no okay good so in the next whatever 5 10 minutes um, i'll try to you know very quickly walk you through some of these um, some of the thoughts that had to go into uh, doing text processing versus natural language processing um okay by the way i'm not talking about the tilda hat solutions i only kept one slide in towards the end but i can i'm happy to talk about you know some of it later on um okay so so let's see uh, think about this right you meet your friend in the morning let's say you meet that person every day and your goal is only to acknowledge that person in a friendly way that yes i have noticed you are here and you know we are friendly so i'm going to just acknowledge that no no asking about how the day was how the weather is you know how is life blah 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 nothing just acknowledging there are these 100 different ways in which you can do that right hey how are you hello how are you what's up man what's up bro and and so on right what has happened is we have we have communicated the exact same intent but using many many different words right or, or many different ways of uh, using x number of words now imagine you are going to a atm and you are withdrawing some cash from there and what happens is you either get an sms or you get a printed receipt out of that atm machine right no matter what time of the day it is no matter how many times you withdraw money no matter what you do right no matter what other changes happen the message that you get out of that atm system is always a static message and i've just written one example here atm wdl for withdrawal and whatever details like you know atm uh, atm which is located in the airport in new delhi amount such and such date such and such so that message is always very static and that's a big difference between natural language processing and non natural or text processing and rightfully so right if if let us say every time i meet sarab jodh and i say hey sarab jodh how are you hey sarab jodh how are you one day he's going to come up to me and say oh you sound very robotic right because he's expecting me to be natural that's this part on the other hand if every time you go withdraw money from the atm the message is different you are going to be a bit puzzled because then you don't know how to interpret it you want to know exactly how much money you withdrew how much is in your is left in your balance and what number to call if there is a discrepancy 
right? So you want in some cases uh, a highly uh, static, non-negotiable message. On on the other hand, in some cases you want the message to be a little fuzzy and so on, right? So that's the big difference between uh, natural language processing and text processing. And why is this important? If you did not know this, a lot of if you don't appreciate this, a lot of what we are going to do next will be uh, you know will be a bit of a problem. And with text becoming such a big deal, um, a lot of genuine problems need to be solved from a from a text perspective. Understanding these nuances is very very important. In fact, in Tilda Head, we are doing quite a lot of these kind of problem solving. Okay, so so let's see what are some of the differences. This is again you know flows back to the question that the very first question that we had at the beginning of the talk, which was what is the what is the role of converting. Of translating business problem into a, a machine learning or data driven problem. This is exactly here. What happens in the text processing side is the structure is probably rigid, but it changes abruptly. And I'll talk a little bit about this later on. I'll give you some examples also. The syntax is coupled with the semantics. Again, if you don't understand this, you know, hold your thoughts. We'll, we'll come back to that in a minute. The third is you only have to analyze the surface manifestation, which means in this ATM example, all you have to do is just look at the message that was typed on the on that you know in, on that receipt that you got. You don't have to interpret a whole lot of it. That's one aspect of text processing, and hence the kind of systems that you would use, the kind of uh, ML algorithms that you would use, feature engineering that you would do will be different. Versus on the NLP side. NLP side, what happens is the manifestation, the surface manifestation, which means the words that you see on or hear, are going to be a smooth variation of the underlying structure. What I mean by smooth variation is uh, uh, the word bro for man or hey man versus hey bro did not happen overnight. Like when we were growing up, we never used the word bro. But it's not like one fine day we said, okay, you're Today onwards, we're going to use the word "bro." It happened over a period of time, so that that change in the in the surface manifestation is very smooth, and hence the kind of data that you will need to learn patterns in NLP is very different. Understanding the intent is very complex. For example, you know, if I see somebody and I say, "Hey, man, you are here," I'm I'm just reading the sentence out, and I'm saying it as if I'm reading it out. Then it's very difficult to know what my emotion is, what my intent is. On the other hand, if I say you are here, then it's very clear that I am surprised to, to see that person here because maybe I was expecting somebody else. On the other hand, if I say you are here, then the then I'm surprised to find the person here because maybe I was expecting this person to be somebody else, right? And so understanding that intent is is not always obvious in the natural language natural language case you have to really dig deeper and hence the kind of models that you will need will be very different right uh, and and again surface manifestation is analyzing it that by itself isn't of value you have to also see some context and so on yeah okay now i'll give you a couple of examples i'm actually going to yeah no i will not lay it out i will i will hold it so oh, just so that there's some aha moment you know, by the time you see the contrast. In the first sentence, you see this is my right. This is my right hand. This is my way to right a wrong. The surface manifestation of the word right is exactly the same. The word right occurring by itself, right? In the first two cases, the left context is also the same, right? So just by looking at the left context, you cannot context, you cannot make out whether the word right is a noun or an adjective. In this case, right? This is my right is a noun. This is my right hand is an adjective. So what I'm saying is manifestation of the surface by itself, surface uh, feature by itself is of of value, yes, but not complete value. You have to look at the left side again. By looking at the left, may not be completely um, completely clear. So you have to look at the right side. That's where context becomes important. And so if you look at your data, the problem that you're trying to solve, stare at it long enough, which is what I do, what I what I make. My my team members, everybody who joins my team, I make them stare at the data for a long time. 
to derive these kind of insights very very important again gets you know gets a lot less uh, attention than it should in fact during my masters days 2000 summer of 2000 i spent the entire summer just looking at speech data didn't write a single piece of uh, algorithm i just looked at the data wrote my you know wrote my insights from it and of course that led to some very good work uh, afterwards so it's very very important that you do what gets called today as you know data data analytics data swimming or you know uh, data exploration and so on okay the third case this is my way to right a wrong i have to look at the full context and say that okay this this right is a work similarly the other example of plant new this plant needs water plant the needs of future generation and so on uh, you have to look at the context to figure out what is the part of speech in in this case yeah and it has long term dependencies both left uh, left and right now if i give you this example mcdonald's ate in a mcdonald's or yodley is in jupiter blog in prestige tech park you have to know the context again to say whether mcdonald's in this case which one of the mcdonald's is a organization uh, restaurant in this case and which one is the person similarly in the second example you have to look at the context to know that jupiter that i'm talking about is not a planet but probably the name of a building right so again the identity is a complex problem from a natural language perspective so the variations are quite smooth uh, i'm going to skip this example in the interest of time but hopefully the idea that uh, the, the message i'm trying to give you all is that if the if the text is natural coming from a natural source the way you interpret it what you would expect from variations is very different compared to uh compared to non natural or just you know system generated text and hence in the natural language the evolution of data is also very very slow oxford dictionary has about 300000 words okay and i looked up some data from last year on an average every quarter only about thousand words on an average get added and there's a very rigorous process you know a bunch of experts come together they sit decide debate and then agree on what are the words that need to be added and what is the meaning for those words now let's contrast that oops 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 oops, oops. okay now let's contrast that with system generated words system generated words what are the examples let us say i am a system administrator and my goal is to send out messages every time a server goes down or i am a system administrator and my job is to keep pinging databases which are in production mongodb database couchbase or whatever else right and just send an alert if the database goes down or i am the i am the person who owns those point of sale machines you know those those pos uh, small machines if you go to if you go to any of the shops and you know buy something and swipe your card Uh, you have to you have to use those uh, pos machines there is somebody who has programmed those machines right so every time a card gets swiped a message comes out that is what is pure text generation or text processing where there is no naturalness the person who has added that syntax can now change that syntax unilaterally right he or she need not have to call a meeting of 100 people and get them all to agree that today onwards we are going to change the message there are other reasons other motivations because of which this person will change that text this is very important by the way if you if you appreciate this then you will know that the kind of mechanisms that we will have to use will be very different yeah so one example i've given i'm giving you here are some of the transactions that you would see uh you know there was initially boston then boston ma massachusetts you know the person for whatever reason decided to just remove the space uh ne boston which is uh, you know new, new england boston or northeast uh, boston and so on uh again unilateral decision no consensus needed this is another complex example where you have sorry uh where you have <clears throat> northampton coming up in n number of different ways just after northampton it is stopped northampton sometimes it is coming twice northwest chicago you know coming uh, coming in one word but the n is gone these are all actual words that we have seen in system generated text which you and i will never ever see in natural language yeah what does this lead to this leads to 80 million words this is one example from uh, from some of the data we were looking at earlier 18 million words 
contrast that with 300,000 words that we that we have in Oxford dictionary, right? And this is like 60 60 times the vocabulary that you have in English. And, and the other thing is, this was just one month's data. Every month, the data would change. So the point is that if you did not know how the data was, or, you know, was evolving over a period of time, what was the source of the data? What is the problem you're trying to solve? you will be stuck using the wrong kind of algorithms and worrying why you're not getting the accuracy, right? So for example, in this case, if you were to use a system which was built purely for natural languages, which let's say have only 300,000 words, that system will not scale when you have 18 million words, right? On the other hand, the complex structure that you're learning in natural language may not be needed when you're interpreting a system generated text. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> temporal sequence. I, I gave you this example earlier. I can very easily, I cannot easily change the temporal sequence in natural language. I cannot unilaterally say that today onwards, I will not say Om ate fruits. I will say Om fruit ate. I mean, I can say it, but nobody will be able to then uh, communicate with me. Right. So there has to be a, a, a consensus. There has to be an agreement. Uh, in terms of the structure of the sentence when it comes to natural language and hence the data that I will need to learn this will be will, will have to be over a period of time. On the other hand, <coughs> excuse me, this the the text that is generated by systems can change abruptly, right? So I am a DBA database administrator. Today, my message is data is database is not responding. Tomorrow, Somebody comes and says, you know what, this is not right. I need to know exactly which database is not responding. So abruptly, without even talking to anybody, I can change it saying, pin failure for DB, name of the database. Now, day after somebody else may come and say, or I myself might feel, you know, I need to know exactly while I'm debugging exactly which time there was an error. So I can unilaterally change the message to no response. I'm not saying anything about database now. No response, name of the database and time of the time at which the response failed. So these changes are happening abruptly. Now, if you were to appreciate these differences in the natural language and the, <clears throat> excuse me, in the system generated text, both of them underlying have you know, text. They're all going to show you whatever 58 different characters that, that you and I are able to see on the screen. But the way in which that data was kept created the way in which their data was put together for interpretation is very different, right? And hence, from a natural language perspective, you need to learn the structure. Very, very important, right? And you have to, over a period of time, prepare for abrupt changes because the abrupt changes won't happen overnight. On the other hand, if you are looking at pure text, which is system-generated text, then it is a lot more important that you actually have a variety of different maps which go from what is the surface manifestation to the actual entry in the dictionary. Examples are these. In, in this case, all of them mean Boston. In this case, the first half means Northampton, the second means Northeastern, and the third means Northwestern, right? So you need to have those kind of uh, mappings to be learned. Hence, in this case, you will need a structure learning algorithm, which could be your uh, LSTM or by LSTM or, or nowadays GRU and so on, which you know, in some sense learn the temporal structure. In the second case, what you need is some sort of a spell check or you know, translation system that takes uh, incorrect spelling, incorrect, you know, uh, incorrect manifestation uh, and incorrect is in quotes and gives you the one exact entry from the uh, from the dictionary. So two different problems. You would not have arrived at this if you had not looked at the data. Um, and hence, it's very important that you spend a lot of time appreciating where the data is coming, what are the kind of manifestations you will see, and, and so on. Right? OK, so then the optimal solution is not anything that is off the shelf, but something that is a combination of what exists on multiple different shelves and what you have to put together. That is essentially what we are doing in, in Tinder Hat, and that's essentially what we had to do 
uh, across a lot of different uh, text processing problems that we had to solve. I'm going to pause here and see if there are any questions. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we do and what kind of uh, you know, what what are the ways in which we can uh, collaborate or inter or interact later on. So, uh, Om, I have a question here. So, I mean, you know, this is uh, interesting, the distinction you're making, because uh, you're right, right? I mean, you look at uh, the Oxford Dictionary and you've got 300,000 words. You look at something like a uh, word to vec model, and it has 3 million words at least, million, right? yes. and not, yes. if not more. Uh, and a lot of them seem like complete nonsense, right? I mean, the, the words like, you know, you were showing there, they're just kind of abbreviations and even misspellings in there. Now, right. from a natural language processing, uh, or at least a you know, text analysis perspective, a lot of the newer models that are coming out are actually looking at trigrams of characters uh, rather than looking at word tokens, right? Or they're looking at a mixture of the two, in fact, also. Right. Um, so, uh, you know, in some ways, if you only look at trigrams of characters or, or you know, even n-grams of characters, sometimes you can lose the semantics of it, even yeah. though you might get a model that is more accurate, right? And uh, by building this, this natural language uh, algorithm, and then explainability becomes an issue. So uh, what in your uh, view is, you know, uh, a better way to go? I mean, you're, you're kind of, is it go towards accuracy and, and even at the cost of explainability or, or should you stick to uh, what is understandable ways of modeling that then kind of uh, allow you to explain them, even if you're using LST right. and agent based right? Right. So this explainability is a very sticky issue. Okay. And I think a lot of, well, well let, me, let me, let me see. The, the answer is a bit nuanced. Uh, you're right that explainability is very important and, and we have to have explainability. I mean, there, there is always a tussle between whether you want to have explainable systems or highly accurate systems. The approach that we've taken, you know, in Tilda had and even in some of the previous organizations is you keep the explainability as much as possible to the inward teams. Hmm. So like some, you know, the team members who are deeply involved in the modeling or, you know, data analytics piece of it should be able to tweak a few parameters and say, okay, you know, if I tweak this parameter, this is the path that was taken for, to, to, to reach a particular answer. And uh, one framework is L I M E lime. I, I forget what it stands for, but it's some explainability uh, framework. We had used this earlier. We're trying to use it now. Actually, we are making it a little generalizable now. Uh -huh. um, so we have, so, so to, to answer your question, we have ways in which the explainability is, uh, is a lot more visible internally uh, because our problems are not like, let's say medical problems or, you know, some very uh, regulatory bodies need to look at our, uh, the way we made uh, come to our answers. So the explainability was a lot more on, uh, you know, to our internal teams. And so we had uh, debug variables which if we are turned on, will give us a lot of these intermediate paths. And then we could explain the outputs to ourselves and then tweak, uh, tweak the modeling or tweak the topology and so on. But to the outside world, accuracy was always a priority because the problems we are looking at were like that. But in the case of medical or you know, any other place, like some, some financial decisions, the regulatory bodies want to know how you reached a particular decision. There is no, uh, no unfair bias and so on. Uh, so in those cases, Explainability, explainability becomes quite important. Yeah. Right, that's an interesting point because the internal team needs to know what is the basis for the prediction, right? And make sure right. that there's some sensible uh, basis. I mean, there's a yeah. lot of examples of attacks on deep learning models and being able to show that uh, you can fool a deep learning model by small <laughs> tweaks in the data, right? And the, the uh, famous example of, I think, uh, was it wolves and, uh, and dogs where it actually became the background of the image that was being picked up, right? Yeah. So uh, how do you deal with that? I mean, in, in, uh, in uh, you know, Tilt Hat or uh, in general in your experience? Um, this, it's a very complex problem, a complex question to answer. And, you know, unfortunately I've had to answer this question to customers who are paying us a lot of money. <laughs> because they, <laughs> you, you know they, they they were giving us money obviously right and, and we were giving them valuable service but valuable in you know in terms of their evaluation also not just our evaluation mm -hmm. but there will be cases where we will make mistakes and you know systems will never be especially data driven systems will never be hundred percent accurate mm -hmm. um, so so it's very difficult to answer that sure 
the and that's where this whole feedback loop becomes very important in fact we had institutionalized ways in which feedback can be incorporated quickly mm -hmm. so that the so that our hope was always that if the user has pointed an error make sure that the same error is not seen by, not seen similar error is not seen by the user again and for that we have to build a huge feedback mechanism uh, in our systems yeah and, so, and so i i know i haven't answered your question but it's a very tough question to answer there is no easy answer my yeah. solution was to just have a feedback system that would right. you know continuously learn and actually you you bring up a, a very important point there also right about that whole feedback because you know one thing that i don't hear a lot of people talking about is the fact that when ai actually starts to mediate between a human and a computer system they are actually changing human behavior as well right and yes. so one of the things yes. in machine learning that we always assume is that the underlying joint probability distribution is is uh, you know stationary it doesn't change right uh, from when we are learning to when we are making predictions but now our models are actually changing behavior and so yeah. how do we deal with that i mean is uh, you know these are the difficult questions i guess difficult that ai questions. systems today are not dealing with right and and right. that's been you know, worrying in some ways right so we yes this this change in the in the underlying models is a fact of life so we have to deal with it and you are right that not many people are actually looking at it one good way of doing this is I mean, well actually there's no good way of doing it it's very it's very dependent on the problem that you have at or you know on your hands one thing that we were trying to do was on a in this feedback loop itself we had some automated ways through which we would find out quote unquote what is called as topic drift yes so looking at that that kind of uh, approach may be of help mm -hmm. uh, but you are absolutely right this needs a lot more attention than what it is getting today yeah and even in machine learning literature right i mean again going back to even uh, you know the mid 90s people were looking at concept drift and you know concept that became drift. quite a topic within triple ai and ichkai and you know the machine learning conferences in general but i don't see as much of that now it seems like everything is deep learning and you know uh, tweaks to architectures so uh, mm -hmm. i was just wondering whether you'd seen something that you could kind of point us to No, no, you are right. You are right. Concept drift, topic drift used to be quite a big thing. Now, some amount of transfer learning—I mean, not some amount, big amount of transfer learning—is trying to address that problem. But, huh. but obviously, deep learning has just, you know, drowned everything else. <laughs> right. And of course, there are there are deep learning ways, driven ways of doing transfer learning. A lot of—I mean, we've seen that very successfully being applied in the image processing side, huh. text processing. It's beginning. I mean, hopefully, it happens. Uh, you know, there's a lot of noise uh, i don't want to take any of the, the popular <laughs> words or terms right now but but it i think it has happened to a great extent the whole transfer learning thing happened to a great extent in the image side uh, it's beginning to happen in the text side maybe another decade or so and we will see substantial improvement sure, sure. a very quick question from nikhil bajaj also uh, how how to process the nlp problems such as where intention is not clear right uh, the message is dynamic so uh, is there a way to process these uh, kinds of sentences or uh, you know what what have you found to be most useful so the hmm, it's very uh, i don't want to give a very diplomatic answer of it depends but <laughs> unfortunately i might just say that because, but please ping me and you know we can we can discuss this in, in more detail later on the reason i'm saying it depends is it depends on the problem that you are solving see if the sentence if your intention is to find the emotion mm -hmm. uh versus to find whether it's a question or a command uh versus to find whether the person is you know whether it's a uh, it's a sentence in the context of what was spoken earlier um so for example this is again my favorite example uh, sarabjot sarabjot told om he is not ready now you have no idea what that he means here like whether mm -hmm. it means you know which of the two people it, it uh, you know it uh, it represents right there you need context so the intent is 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 most in almost all cases dependent on the context and also dependent on the problem you are trying to solve uh so nikhil yeah the the answer will depend a lot on on what you are trying to do some some ways of doing this obviously you know distributed representation like what to wake or glove or anything else in right. fact we do a lot of combination of word and subword 
subword level representation is one way of figuring out uh, contextual intent but then again you need to have some sort of a label data that sits on top and that says this data is this label this data is this label and then have some sort of a classifier on top mm -hmm. great uh, there is another question but let's uh, uh, you know move forward and i can ask it at the end sure okay i have to actually you know uh, we are running over so in the next five minutes so sure sure yeah yeah um, yeah so i just wanted to kinds of help from you all one is of course uh, you know we have these uh, weekly seminars we do every week there's a different topic you're all welcome to join this sunday we have network technologies then we have big data engineering and so on but more importantly i'm looking for volunteers who are looking for career progression uh, you know be it not necessarily data science but any kind of career progression uh volunteers who can test our systems we are in the process of now releasing our second beta uh so anyway so we do a bunch of text summarization text understanding uh and use that for uh for ranking matching and recommendation uh so if anybody is interested in in talking to me about that i'm i'm more than happy to uh, to do that um brilliant Okay, I'm sure there will be doing too much yeah. of self promotion, so I'll go back. To <laughs> okay, so so then just the last question uh, from Mohan. He says, uh, I think NLP text processing needs to consider the resource bundling, uh, as in uh, you know multilingual websites need to yeah. take into account the geography, the language of the user, the kinds of mechanisms like slang and geography, dialect. Yeah. Uh, you know, how do we deal with all of these differences? Context. My answer to this is context. it is it is context is uh we as humans are very good at remembering a lot of contextual data and then applying it in the right place uh machines today are not able to do that i mean obviously there has been a lot of progress over the last couple of decades but it has it is nowhere near the the stage that you and i as humans are able to use context right i can speak fluent english and then suddenly you acha in you know hindi word and go back to english again mm. uh, and nobody in the room will have a problem you know making that switch to the other language and then coming back to the predominant language that was part of the conversation because you all have some context that uh, you know i look indian we are in an indian setup so if i use a word which doesn't sound english you will immediately switch context look up the vocabulary in one of the indian languages uh probably not a language that you can guess i don't know uh and then you know go back to the to the to the main context that mm -hmm. context switching we are very good at uh, as humans machines aren't aren't good at it yet and so so to your problem to your point mohan it's a big problem to be solved uh ways in which we can bring in more systematic context in the systems uh, and deep learning by the way all of the deep learning architectures the reason they have become so popular is they are able to uh, bring in a lot of these contextual information very systematically mm. right i mean we had a we had a paper uh, we never had a paper in yardley yardley was not into that kind of work but in xerox about xerox is about 5 4 5 years ago we had a paper on multimodal uh, multimodal deep learning architectures and the idea was you know we were doing a lot of multimedia analysis work speech text and images Uh, videos in this case uh, so we had one architecture for for text one for speech and one for the videos and in the end it was as simple i mean i'm overly simplifying the statement it was as simple as taking two architectures one for text one for speech and appending a third one to it which brought the video context and our results went up substantially right. uh, so so yeah so the short answer to your question is bringing in context is very important a uh, slightly longish answer is some of the deep learning architectures allow you to bring in bring that in uh, but a lot of feature engineering as well as a lot of right kind of generalizable data is very important hmm. and i i guess uh, you know you were talking about how uh, you know the the changes to the oxford dictionary might be much slower but um, the use of words uh, may start right in general prior to the oxford dictionary even suggesting that it should be added in right. and so you have this smooth transition to words that uh, are not in the dictionary right so you might start using 
uh, certain Indian words like "acha" might be, you know make it to the Oxford Dictionary, but oh, because of the context, sorry, sorry, <laughs> I, said, I was going to say "bazaar" as a word exactly. Maybe. Exactly. Right. And so, uh, you know, so there are many examples of that. And, and I guess the kind of nice thing about the deep learning architectures that are building these, uh, you know, word vectors, because they're taking the context into account, they may will, will uh, you know, they may well be able to deal with these words that are used from different languages, but within, you know, uh, the, the context, which is uh, in English. And be able to actually start putting meaning to that, right? Which I think is very, very cool about. This. Yes, yes, Ab you, you're, you're bang on target. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, so Om, thank you very much. This has been oh, sure. extremely good, and uh, you know we've been uh, extremely um, uh, unfair to you by by grabbing another half, half hour of your time as well, no, no, no. This is, this <laughs> and not fun. letting you go. Uh, but I think uh, you know you brought on uh, some very interesting points that uh, you know previous speakers have not uh, you know focused on, and I think this is going to be very useful for all of those who've been listening to uh, your talk. Um, you know, and I really appreciate that. And I'd love to, uh, you know, have you back at some point uh, to sure. interact more with the, the, the folks here at Sabud. Uh, and indeed, I'm, you know, I'm sure, uh, you know, for the folks here, if you want to reach out to Om directly and, and uh, uh, you know, become beta testers for uh, the software, uh, you know, uh, please go ahead and do that. I would encourage you to do that because I think one of the, the, the big things that I find is that youngsters today, when they come to do machine learning internships, they think it's all about building neural networks, right? And they actually ignore everything else around it. And that, that, that image tagging that happens, uh, which is painful, uh, you know, you've got to understand what is the right way of doing that. You've got to understand how to interpret the results. And you brought up a number of different examples of that, uh, you know, with the cost-based, uh, uh, you know, um, classification and so on as well. And uh, interpreting that because you have to close the loop. And that's also another thing that, uh, you know, competing in Kaggle will not teach you, right? Or competing yeah, yeah. in other competitions and hackathons will not teach you. So I think this is really, really great that you've made that offer. Uh, and I would encourage everybody to go and, um, you know, try and uh, be part of that experience. And there's a lot of learning in actually beta testing a data product like this. So thank you all thank you. for making that accessible to the students here as well. And thank you for spending the time with us. It's been sure, really sure. wonderful. Thank okay. you. Take Thank care. you all for having me. Okay, bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.